It is Tuesday, May 21st, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today. You know those dudes, Justin Pennick, Bobby Skinner. I am Chris Rose. Producer Mikey is here as well as we continue to break down our divisions in just a few minutes. We will get to the AFC East. But, gentlemen, how are we doing? Are we, um, this is kind of the interesting part of the football calendar. I know that now the NFL's proclamation is basically there's no days off, there's no off season in the NFL. But I feel like if we're we're pretty close to it, if there is one, Bobby. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, it is. Like you have OTAs, but those are those are like you know those are the vacation work days. Um, but I'm actually having the most fun doing these episodes for football today oh. now because we're able to, you know, take some big picture approaches, talk about teams, and spend a little more time and not reacting to news. So I actually enjoy these episodes. But uh, yeah, me and Justin went to a charity softball game this weekend for uh, Dexter Lawrence and Brandon Jacobs, so that was oh. fun. We hosted some people in a box. It was it was a very fun time. So uh, getting back to real life now. Well, hold on, Panic. Did you get to rub elbows with anybody from the Giants' world? Well, I took some nice pictures of some beat reporters that were making funky faces, and I okay. posted them. We got um, to our box. He had a signed Jay Alford destroying yes. tom brady uh coffee cup that was going to be my story where you know uh the guy that runs it license plate guy is like he's basically like the fireman ed for the new york jets except mm. he didn't quit on the giants fan base whenever they got ah. bad um neither here nor there knows that jay alfred is a super bowl 42 hero of mine because that was the play that basically convinced me it's like all right we we won the game when jay alfred just steamrolls brady so it was even cool of course i got the mug and then joe brings uh jay over to the dugout and kind of points at me, and then they both wave at me, and I'm filming everything, and I wave back. So I, I'll always have that moment on camera. It was a fun time up in Pomona, New York. So how old were you? Were you like eight when they won Super Bowl Forty Two? I was. I was nine, nine, ten. Wow. Yeah, it's like you entering are... your sports phantom peak right there. Mm-hmm. You are so fortunate. So yeah. fortunate. Oh my God! And then All four right. years later. And yeah, thank you. Thank you from all Browns fans. Appreciate you. Uh, we are focusing on the AFC East, but uh, our one bit of news is that Tua did show up for OTAs for the Miami Dolphins. There was some question as to whether or not he would do that. Of course, he is in the last year of his rookie deal. Uh, he's going to make $23 million. We keep hearing that, you know, Chris Greer is working on a deal with the agents and all that sort of stuff. They haven't exchanged financial figures and All of that. Um, Bobby, I want to start with you here because you've been fairly critical of Tua, it feels like. What do you think that they're going to do about his future? And what do you think they should do? Because it might not be the same thing. It's such a tough spot, right? Because it's easy for us to outside in and be like, hey, I just don't think Tua is going to be the guy that's going to be like at the top level of quarterback play in the NFL. Right. Despite the fact that there's great stats and stuff, but you also can't just like let him go and like, okay, here we're riding with Jacoby Brissett next year, you know? So you, you kind of, you kind of have to get something done if, or if you want to get, if you truly want to get something done with him. Right. And like operating this with good faith, you have to figure out some type of exit plan, but Tua wants golf money. Right. And they're not going to, I don't think they're going to settle for much less than that and that's a huge investment right that's 53 million per year and you look at the guaranteed money of like 112 like oh well it's it's just two years guaranteed but the bonuses is what made you know 78 million dollars of golf's contract so even like when the outs are there in golf's contract you could save 25 million and after you know in the third year that's 29 million dollars of dead cap and even 15 million dead cap in the last year despite 47 of savings um I would play the season out and franchise tag him. If if I if if we are if we view him the same way we do now at the end of the season, I would franchise tag him unless unless there's some other option to upgrade, like maybe Dak if he gets a free agent or whatever. But th- that's what I would do. If he if he answers all the questions we have this year, if they win versus playoff teams and he goes above and beyond what Mike McDaniel puts in front of him, then hey, yes, yeah, so, sign him to an extension. But if we look at him the same exact way a year from uh you know nine ten nine ten months from now i would just franchise tag him unless there's a better option out there would you rather pay to a 50 million a year or dak prescott close to 60 million a year dak i mean and and 
you guys know I'm not the biggest Dak fan no, in the world, not. but I, I I do think there's a a decent gap between the two guys. And I and I agree. We're I as we've been dissecting this Dallas Cowboys situation, and you know we we don't really even go back and forth because I think we acknowledge that the Cowboys and Dak Prescott may be headed towards you know a spot where a divorce could make sense, but if you want to talk about a situation of a team that should think about moving on from a quarterback that gets good results and puts up good stats and puts up a lot of yards, a lot of points, a lot of touchdowns, and also a good amount of wins, but can you can that quarterback take you to the next step? I don't think that should be Dak Prescott. I I think it should like we we should be talking about that specifically with Tua. And I love I love that approach of playing the season out. He may not like the franchise tag, but if you're in the same spot. And then also, I do think from the Miami Dolphins standpoint, where you have this window with Waddle and you have this window with Hill and you you just have this window where they're playing really good football right now, I do think the Dak Prescott situation is worth monitoring for the Miami Dolphins. So the, the question coming in last year about Tua was strictly, for the most part, about his health. Right, He's coming off those two concussions, that horrible hit on Thursday night football that we all saw, the wobbling, all that sort of stuff. So we're like, man, he's just got to show us that he can – He can. well, last year he played all 17 games, and he played pretty well. Yes. And until the fourth quarter of the last regular season game of the 2023 NFL season, they were going to be division champs in the two seed. That's the issue, though. What's the issue? Is- the last three games of the season, right? Like, let, like let, let, I went through those last three games. They could have went 13-4 and four and been the number one seed playing in Miami, and they scored 19 on Baltimore in a blowout, 14 on Buffalo in an AFC East title game, and then seven on the Chiefs in the playoffs. He had five interceptions those three games. And I'm talking ugly interceptions, right? I went mm-hmm. back and rewatched because sometimes you look at the raw interceptions. Like, what were these? Because I remember them being bad. You had a 21-13 game going into the half against the Ravens. They're driving. He throws into double coverage. Then later in the game, throws into quadruple coverage versus the Ravens. And then in the versus the Bills, an underthrown ball into double coverage versus with Tyreek Hill. Then a final drive of the game, again, into double coverage down seven. And then versus the Chiefs, just a completely ugly overthrow. And then you look at like the Dolphins went one and six versus playoff teams, averaging 13 points per game. Mm-hmm. And we we all love Mike McDaniel. We love those offensive pieces they had around them. They had the best yards per carry. Uh, in the NFL last year, despite the fact having a quarterback who only rushed for 80 yards. Um, it it just feels so similar to Jimmy G in San Francisco with me, with Tua. Wow. That, I mean, come on now. Jimmy G was But not... we did all this with Jimmy G, though, yeah. right? Oh, we won games. Look at the EPA per plays, best in the league. Like, you go look at it. Like, it j- if you go look at those numbers with he's in San Fran efficiency wise, he's Jimmy G's top five in the NFL every single year. It just feels so, so similar to that. You know, and at least Jimmy G took him to a Super Bowl, won a couple playoff games where I, I am not convinced that Tua could do that. And I keep going back to the pre two and a half seconds and post two and a half second stats. I, I can go through them if you want. I, I, I was, basically right when i've when i theorized that on on previous episodes but why that's so important to me pre two and a half seconds and post two and a half seconds like all all around 65 to maybe even up to 70 percent of nfl throws are on your first read so if you're if you're on your first read odds are you are getting the ball out before two and a half seconds and the dolphins and tua have been has been the best quarterback since Mike McDaniel and getting the ball out the quickest and also having the most yards, having the most completions, having the most touchdowns, it's been really good. And it helps when you have two really good wide receivers as well. But the good teams, when you get down to it, like Bobby said, through the last three games of the season, and then especially when you get to the postseason, they're going to be good enough where they're going to take away your first read. I don't care how good Mike McDaniel is. I don't care how good Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell is. They're going to take away your first read. And so it's what do you do after that for Tua? that I get concerned and I'm convinced that against the bad teams, they're going to take care of business. They're going to look great. They're going to score a lot of points. They're going to get a lot of big plays, but it's against those better teams with those better defense where they are going to take away that first read and you're going to hold on to that ball for longer. What are you going to do? And Tua does not have a good grasp on that right now. Okay. So but ask yourself, what is the weakest link of the Dolphins offense right now? I, I know you could go the, point towards the offensive line or stuff, yes, but like I, I would say the interior of their offensive line. 
which is fair, right? They lost Connor Williams, and we'll talk about that when we talk about them as a team. But two is like the wide receivers are obviously a huge strength. The coaching is a huge strength. The running game was the most efficient in the NFL last year. Um, you know, behind that same exact offensive line. I know again, a lot of that has to do with Mike McDaniel as the coach. It's just like and he can get Tua can get better, right? We can t- we can change our conversation around him. Like Jared Goff is a bet much better quarterback than the Rams version of himself, despite mm-hmm. being really efficient. Um uh, but I just he hasn't put himself even in the golf category yet to me. Um well, I guess Bobby, what is it that's going to is it gonna be what if he duplicates statistically what he did last year and gets the team to the playoffs as a wild card and they bow out again? It that's I not think good it, enough I, for you. It's good enough for me to keep him on my team, but I'm not gonna just I'm I would I would franchise tag him as tough as a decision as that is, because Again, it also it depends on how it looks, right? That offense is very much like you said, first read, or make you the defense think the first read and then hit the second thing, like you know, pre, essentially pre-planned second read type of stuff. Um, you know, like Mike McDaniel does such a great job. I just it seems like every time we're having this conversation with the quarterback, we go back. Like, how often do we look back and be like, "Oh, nope, he ended up being that." Well. All right, so if we play the what if game and he gets franchised, it's probably right around forty million next year. And the you know the advantage financially of signing him long term is it gives you more cap flexibility. Um, the difference is if hey if they could get a deal done where it's a true two year like there's a true get out after two years, like then Daniel I would Jones? do it, huh? Like Daniel Jones? Like Daniel Jones was originally, and then they restructured Daniel Jones. So you can't touch it, right? You can't be, mm-hmm. you know, touch it to get out of it. But if it's like Jared Goff's, where on, if you just look at Jared Goff's guaranteed money, you're going to think, oh, that's that's a two year deal. But the, the signing bonus is $80 million, which is spread evenly. So they're going to have $29 million of dead cap in the second to last year of that deal. And then even though they'd say 47 the last year, they'd have 15 mil of dead cap, which. Again, it's nothing compared to $47 million in savings, but it's got to be a true two-year out. So you can, if you have an opportunity to upgrade or if he just falls flat, you don't get there. But I'm not doing it before yeah. this season, right? There's right. no I way Tua got, should agree. Gotta, you can do it in season, like see how he looks, yeah. but you can't do it uh, You can't do it this season because you always have the franchise tag as a tool in your back pocket too. You know, and then to even be pro Tua for a second, no way Tua should agree to – a deal where he it, he has an out after the second year, he's like I, I you know there's been times where I've been an MVP candidate for crying out loud. So like why am I gonna have a QB deal where I, there's gonna an out after the second year? So for two I'm not even taking that. It's it's a tough it's always a tough situation because it's like he's not bad. No, oh, there was a point where even early in le- early parts of last year and then even 2022 when he was struggling with some of the health stuff where I'm like this is. This is good, and I almost couldn't believe how different of a quarterback Tua was going from check down Charlie under Brian Flores to now, oh, we're getting the ball out quick, and we're throwing it down the field, and we're being explosive. Like, really changed the way that he was operating a quarterback. Really impressive, but for them to go get to another spot team-wise, there's another level that he's got to get to. All right, let's wrap it up with this. Raise your hand if you think that Tua is the Dolphins' opening day starter in 2027. 2027. Let the record show my hand is down. Uh, my hand is down, but if you said 2026, I would raise my hand. I think that's the that's the over-under right there. That's the line. <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of us will take that one on 2027. Uh, and finally, for the record, um, Dolphins general manager Chris Greer did say back in January, we never talk about money or anything with two as reps, just good conversations about where he is and the relationship with Mike McDaniel, et cetera. He said uh, the goal has I mean, always If you're not been... talking money going to the last year of your franchise quarterback yeah, I don't deal, know that's when a little he's... worrisome. Yeah, he did say that the goal <laughs> what is are to you have talking him... about? The goal is to have him here long-term playing at a high level. I don't know what the hell that means. All right. I mean that's uh, that's great avoidance of a question. That's what that is right there. That's A plus PR GMing. Um, let's get to the AFC East. The Bills, they're just hammering away at this division. But 
interesting offseason, which obviously was highlighted by the trade of Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans. So it feels like Buffalo took a step back, at least talent-wise, in the offseason. Is it a mistake, Justin, to ask Josh Allen to possibly shoulder even more of the load while trying to chase down Patrick Mahomes atop the AFC? Yes, because I really just I don't love these receivers, but also at the same time, Josh Allen can do it. But because Josh Allen can do it and because he can carry a team and carry an offense and things like that, that doesn't give you I don't think that gives you the excuse to just want to do it. Oh, because Josh Allen can do it. I don't know, man, like these receivers do scare me. Um, but if there is one thing like, you know, even just to get away from the offensive side of the ball for a second, since we've really talked about, we've talked about the receivers and and things like that for the bills quite often. If there's one team that gets the injury excuse last year and it, and it's like a green flag for me, like, all right, you're, you're, you're granted here with this, with this in- excuse, it's the Buffalo bills. Cause they had Tr- Tredavious white went down in week four. He had a season ending Achilles tear. He had a week later, Matt Milano, he lost his year with the broken leg. Daquan Jones, who was having a really good year, tore his, mech, his pec muscle, sidelined him for 10 games. I mean, th- those are basically you know three star players for the Buffalo Bills. And then you also had Von Miller, Micah Hyde, Kyer Elam, all missed at least three games. Um, and that didn't improve in the postseason either. Like, they didn't get like healthy, healthy at the stretch. Mm-hmm. They, they lost more guys. So um, usually teams... When they use the injury excuse, it's the difference between, oh, this is why we were bad versus we were good. The Bills were still a good football team. It's just it's a matter of can you go and can you beat the Kansas City Chiefs? Um, And they were not able to do that with all the injuries that they had last year. So uh, I thought that's definitely like, hey, if Doug McDermott's going to save his job, that's a saving grace. The defensive injuries, plus you fired, uh, you know, you hired Joe Brady, you got Ken Dorsey out of there. Um, But I am a little worried that their offensive approach is, Oh, Josh Allen's just gonna gonna get us. Or are they thinking of making it a little bit more conservative, running the ball a little bit more successfully, like they did with James Cook last year? And that's kind of like McDermott and Brady's MO is taking the ball out of Allen's hands a little bit more so he doesn't have to carry that load. I I mean, I just don't think it's a plan. I think it was out of necessity, right? Like the the Josh mm-hmm. Allen cap hit is is starting is going to start really hitting right this year it's thirty next year forty three and then you get sixty three fifty six it's and and it's going to be touched a lot it's probably going to be restructured before the season starts because I mean think of all the guys they lost now Diggs they actually lost money but they were just done with him they lost Davis Morris Bates Hyde Poyer Tre'Davious White Floyd Terrell Dodds and Sarah O'Neill and others right like other guys who are starting like on other teams but just aren't of note on them. They were like, and they again, they they're gonna need to move some money around to get through the season with their cap space right now. Um, so it's a it's kind of a reset year. They need to do like what the Chiefs they they're they need their sorry, excuse me, let me slow down, Bobby. They need their drafts to start hitting <laughs> right. That that's when you have when you have a quarterback making this money and a great quarterback, you need your drafts to start hitting. Josh Allen's still only twenty seven. To me, he's the second best quarterback in the nfl and let's let's get the right role players for the right price like curtis samuel could be a really nice piece for them right we saw more of what the vision of joe brady offense was down the stretch anyways when you saw james cook's numbers increase and di- uh, digs decrease substantially i mean digs went from 86 to 43 yards per game through that joe brady run that's crazy drop off curtis samuel had his best season in the nfl with joe brady in carolina um I truly think a lot depends on their draft this year. Like Keon Coleman and Cole Bishop, the safety out of Utah. Those guys are are, are critical, right? Is Cole Bishop going to be able to plug and play right there? He's the he's the type of safety that Sean McDermott and Bobby Babbage, their defensive coordinator, really like. And then Keon Coleman, right? We talked with Baldwin or stuff like that. That doesn't really fit the MO of the Joe Brady. No, are the, are they going like, to use like Coleman pick. to his best? That's a huge question mark. But I think last year's Dalton Kincaid, I think he's going to have a great – year right i think he has top three tight end receiving yards in the nfl next year you know and even as a rookie at 73 catches for 670 yards he's going to be huge for them it's just about hitting the draft and and they even traded down a couple times in this last draft to set up next year where they're going to have a lot more picks so do you know which afc team heading into 2023 i think by most pundits opinion downgraded their wide receiver core if not as substantially as a Stefan Diggs, definitely downgraded it. 
It's the Kansas City Chiefs, right? The Kansas City Chiefs. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think that they were the last team standing a year ago. Mm -hmm. So you uh, too much is given, much is expected. And I do believe that Josh Allen can do it. One thing I want to see him do, I really want to see him stop taking hits, man. Stop taking, and I know people, have, well, that's his DNA. That's who he is. Hey, right now, we need you standing. We need you standing. You need to stop fighting for an extra, you know, 36 inches all the time. When he calls for it, go get us that and go win us that game. Get us that first down to win us the game, but save it. Um, I think that they could be similar to the Kansas City Chiefs. Rely a little bit more on the run game when you need to. They don't have a tight end that's anywhere near Travis Kelsey, but those two, Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid, that could be a little bit of a matchup issue for some teams. And I then think last, Kincaid's going to thrive this year. I, I do too. I think he's going to explode. And can Keon Coleman do for the Bills what Rasheed Rice did for the Chiefs, particularly the second half of the year? Well, the rest of it's been a mess since the Super Bowl. But uh, on the field, he was really good. Maybe. Maybe. But I think that they're – don't you think they're still the favorite heading into this year? Me I, For the AFC East, yeah, absolutely to me. I mean, again, nope. you're the second-best quarterback in the NFL. Oh. I know Justin's on, like, uh, a Jets kick right now. And, <laughs> hey, I is. get it, right? Like, it's not it's not a crazy thing to say. Um. But I, I still think they have some like decent talent on defense, especially up front. They've got some solid depth. Matt Milano should be, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he looks coming back. Um, I think Bobby Babich is going to be a good defensive coordinator for them. He's been their, you know, safety and linebacker coach the last four years. Do we have any idea just, this is this is something maybe we should put a pin on? Uh, is uh, Babich going to be the play caller on defense? Because uh, McDermott called I plays know. on defense for the first time since I think he like when he was in Carolina. Um, I'm going to look that up right now. While you're looking it up, I can tell you that we're going to know pretty quickly, I think, what this team is about. Now, you have to keep in mind, through 10 games last year, they were a 500 club. And we were like, God, are they even going to make the playoffs? And then they went on that run uh, right after the bye to solidify things, not only make the playoffs, but win the two seed on that last Sunday night game down in Miami. But this year, four of their first six are on the road, and those road games are Miami, Houston, Baltimore, and the Jets. Oh. So, yeah, we're going to know pretty quickly, probably by mid to late October, what we're looking at with the Buffalo Bills. We well, not even. I think about last year, they were going to miss the playoffs, and then they like right. figured it out down the show. I think when you have a quarterback like Josh Allen, you just you just figure stuff out, right? Like, you yeah. are a team that really can change and adapt throughout the year. Think about even Kansas City's. I know they their offense never was at, like, the level that it was the, you know, the begin you know, those first four years when they had Tyreek, but, like, when you have Josh Allen, you can adapt to whatever you're getting, right? Okay, you're, you're going to play deep. We're going to run the ball. You're going to do this. We're going to take our shot. Like, it just gives you that ultimate trump card. The issue with Josh Allen is that he keeps facing Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs, and well, Mahomes wins the, that has yeah. won that matchup. Uh, whether it's 13 seconds, whether it's last year, it just Mahomes has been the – Mahomes is the better quarterback. And the better play caller. Uh, yep, they're better That's play right. caller. Yeah. Honestly, probably better, you know, talent, uh, you know, around around them on defense. If if you look at this last year, I know the Bills' defenses have been pretty good, but the way they play, you know, the thirteen seconds, soft defense, all that, blah blah blah. Um, so yeah, it's again we talked about it with Field, uh, you know, Field Yates on the last episode. It's like, man, it's just you you see them fall short and you want to judge them, but it's just like. Okay, but what what team over the last five years has been more successful than the Buffalo Bills? The Kansas City Chiefs? Who else? The San Francisco 49ers? Yeah, it's not a long list. No, now, they are in a reset year, right? Because they had to be. They didn't, they, this isn't some like big choice by them, but they had to reset. They had to let all those guys walk, or they just would have not been, you know, cap, uh, what's the word, uh, compliant. All right, let's move on to the second-place Miami Dolphins. Uh, they have been one and done in the playoffs in each of Mike McDaniel's first two years as a head coach. Panic, do you expect the Dolphins to take that next step or take a step back in 2024? I know we just talked about Tua, but there's a lot more to digest with this team. No, no, I, I don't. And I, I unfortunately, I already kind of said my talking point where I, I think the bad teams 
will struggle against the Dolphins, and there there will be games where, you know, hey, oh, look at the Dolphins putting up 40 points, and they're only allowing 17. Um, you know, I think there's, that's going to happen this year, and we're going to look at it and be like, oh, Dolphins are here, man. But then the good teams are going to know what the Dolphins are trying to accomplish. And, you know, we talk about Vic Vangio leaving and the fact that they have a pass rush that a lot of them are coming off of season-ending injuries. And you draft Chop Robinson in the first round, too. So it's a deep room. But what is that defense going to look like? You lose Wilkins. So, uh, like I said, that's that's my summary of the Miami Dolphins. And until they prove to me otherwise that they could get a good team in Miami or even go on the road and beat a good team, um, that's my opinion of them. They'll do good against the bad teams, and then the good teams they're going to struggle against. Yeah, so like you look through their win loss schedule, and you put them like somewhere between eleven and nine wins. But I, I want to keep it simple. Like, I want, let's go through them. which team in the AFC are you choosing them against in a playoff game? Chiefs, no. Bills, no. Texans, any yeses? I hear no. silence. Bengals, you know that could be a game, but no. Ravens. Even with the Ravens, you know, we're not, we're seeing, might see some fall off. No. The Jets, would you pick them over the Jets in a playoff game? No. I want to see the Jets. I do too. So, hey, that's a TB to be decided. Um, But that, that was five, like, not even think about it. Uh, And I'd say the Chargers, right? They beat the Chargers by two points last year in week one. We're going to see huge coaching upgrades. You, you asked me Chargers, Dolphins in the playoffs right now. I'm picking the Chargers. Right, but that—that's five wow. teams that we said a clear no. I'm not so sure about that last one. I'm okay, but but again, like there's you, you know we argue point the Jets. Is, there's point other is taken. Teams, the Browns you could argue, right? There's other you know the Colts you can argue. There's other arguable teams, but there's five just no. So, point is taken. Yeah, I understand all that. Um, do you guys have any idea? Which team has the longest playoff victory drought in the NFL? I mean, I, I'm a, I'm going to use context clues and say the Miami Dolphins. Bobby, I'm so happy that you've been paying attention in class. Wow. Would you have known that if we hadn't done this on today's show? I actually would. Ha- I'm in Florida, so I, you know, I see some yeah. Dolphin stuff here and there. So I, I did know that one. It, it changed once Detroit won the, um, yes, won the playoff game. Yeah. Do you, do you remember it? Are you old enough to... To know this one um was it with um jay fielder at quarterback or was it with marino jay fielder uh no it was not marino he was retired so it was the 2000 season i i know this because i was working that day at fox sports radio watching the game and it was lamar smith who scored in overtime against the indianapolis colts was jay fielder the quarterback i i think that's probably who it was i'm gonna say if you want to look, look up the right now. yeah, but I remember that I think it was something like twenty. I want to say twenty three seventeen. If I'm going to get a score, oh, I'm, you got it, twenty three seventeen. Wow, boom! Did not look it up last night. I'm telling you, yeah. But I remember it was a lowish scoring game. Peyton Manning yeah. can't win in the playoffs. Yeah, it was oh. Jay Fiedler. Okay, good call on that. Uh, Dartmouth, I believe, Jay Fiedler. Um, first uh, recruitment letter from, and I got I played with them on NCAA football. After that, with the, oh. with a custom Bobby Skinner on the NCAA video game, how what does Bobby what does a custom Bobby Skinner look like in pads, shoulder pads? And I mean, I look I look pretty. I probably look better on pads than I did on the field. Um, so <laughs> I look pretty. Now I had a you know a dark visor, oh, um, yeah. and maybe some armbands. Was there um, hair coming out of the helmet or no? No, you had short hair, right? No, I had short hair in high school. What a bummer! You sweat too much. I lo- I looked good in shorts for what it's worth when I played. So my point is, is that last year the Dolphins on Christmas night were 11 and four and sitting as the two seed with a possibility of being the one seed. Then they gave up 56 at Baltimore. And they lost Bradley Chubb in the last three minutes of a meaningless fourth quarter. They gave up 14 points to Buffalo in the fourth quarter at Sunday night game and lost in the division. And they became frozen fish, even though they're a mammal out in Kansas City. So that is how we remember the Miami Dolphins season. It's not for dropping 70 on the Denver Broncos. It's not for having an explosive running game. And in my opinion, getting better with the addition of Jalen Wright, who I thought was a fantastic pick for them, uh, even if he doesn't contribute a ton this year. They are as fun to watch 
at times as any NFL team, and none of us will touch them when it counts. So, wh- and then again, we talk about this on our power rankings. Like, this is the team that probably we are like our biggest like expected drop off. You know, without like losing something, you know, major to their team. So, it, um, is it, I guess my question is: Are we missing something? Is it possible that the three of us? Let's try and look at it from a positive Miami lens, like where the answer is yes, Chris. They will take a step forward because of, or there's just too many butts in the sentence when we want to talk about that panic. Well, they have a great coach. Sorry, my name's not Panic. That's okay. All right, but I think that's a good good one to start with. But you know, they're the the issue that we're arguing is that we're not arguing that they're bad. We're arguing that they're good, and it's not easy to be great even against bad NFL teams. A lot of most of the NFL, even some good teams, aren't great against bad teams. Like the, you kind of just trek your way through opponents, and sometimes you win close games, and sometimes that's held against teams of you know winning the close games and crap like that. So it's not even like we're saying that they're a bad team. I just I don't want to fall for it anymore because I was in. I was in. I was like, okay, you know, look at this explosiveness without really looking into it, right? And and kind of getting getting a whiff of the Dolphins on first glance and kind of falling in love with the idea of what they could be. But then they disappoint you way too many times doing the same things over and over again, not succeeding. And it's like, all right, we just know what they are. But they are good, though. That's the thing. And they can be really good. It'll be interesting to see what McDaniel comes out to start the season, right? Like last year, that short motion, like he kind of swept, that stuff swept the league where all the, you know, the best play callers started, you know, copying that. And that led to, you know, that was like that Chargers game in 2022 was the ultimate like, ah, Staley figured it out. This is mm-hmm. how you play Tua. And then McDaniel, you know, zagged off of that. And and then they, you know, figured out what the Chargers were doing to to, to get off of that. Uh, I remember being like in love with that the first week. That was like the biggest takeaway was that. Do um, they have a blocking tight end? Is, Dur- is Durham Smythe a blocking tight end? Yeah, and John who can mm-hmm. block too. So mm-hmm. the, so they got so they got John o. Smith, but there was even a certain point in 2022 when they just had Gasecki. I was pretty I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they Gasecki well, was never a, a fit with them. Yeah. No, 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 no. But here's my point. Here's my point, and this is this is a good McDaniel's point, where they're running 21 person. What other team is running 21 personnel at the rate that they do, having a 50 percent pass rate out of that, which I think is high for such a big, which for mm-hmm. such a big running formation. And getting all these explosives. What other team is using their number one wide receiver, who is not six foot four, six foot five, by the way, but Tyreek Hill, who is small, putting him in a two point stance behind either the tight end or the tackle, and then putting him in. I mean, it's just there's no other team that's doing what they're doing from a schematic standpoint, and it's so fun and it's such an advantage to be able to throw out of those running formations because then then you get defenses out of personnel that doesn't match what you're giving them on the offensive side of the ball so again it could be great but it's just not yeah the offense is going to be good enough to win games and get them to the playoffs most likely now the defense again there's like they lost Fangio they add Anthony Weaver who's you know been the Ravens D-line coach assistant head coach you know, he only had he was a Texans DC for an awful defense in 2020, but the talent was awful, so I'm not going to hold that against him. Like we guys mentioned, Phillips and Chubb coming off of an Achilles and ACL. You lost Christian Wilkins and Van Genkel. You know, you like the secondary of Ramsey, Fuller, Holland, and Poyer, but like, what, what does that defense look like with after losing uh, Vic Fangio and having some guys banged up and losing, you know, probably what was your best player in, in Christian Wilkins? Um, even though there would be some frustration with him there too, uh, even too. It's just, I don't know. What, so my question is, will they beat, you know, like let's, because I did go through their schedule before this. Well, I got it. Yeah, I got it right here. So the, the first. like, Do they beat the Colts? Do, do they win the games versus like the Colts? Those are the, the Colts, the Seahawks, right? Those teams that are like bubble playoff teams. Those right. are the games that I'm paying attention to the most with, yeah. with the Dolphins this year. But they're also going to put up, they could put up some serious points early on too, right? Mm-hmm. Like they could put them up against the Titans. I mean, I don't know what the Seahawks defense is going to look like in week three. I know their head coach is. Yeah. That know. Seahawks game is critical because, and they could still beat Buffalo. Like they can beat Buffalo week two, right? They've done it before. Oh, yeah. You know, they did it in 2022. They beat Buffalo in the beginning of that season. They go at what? Three and three and oh, or four and oh. Um, 
you know, so there's like they could be we could be talking about this team being five and oh. Right? And, and we'll talk about we, how will good we they look. <laughs> but yeah, and then it'll be could... hard not to, right? It's always hard to do the, it's hard it's hard to talk about a team in week five and talking about, well, they're gonna lose in the playoffs. Sometimes sometimes I hate that analysis, but I think that's part of the story with Tua right now. It's not even just playoffs, it's against win it's against good teams. Because they went one and six versus playoff teams last year. The only team they beat was the Dallas Cowboys. And by the way, they they could be setting us up again for the end of the season. Their last six games are at Packers, home against the Jets, at Texans, home against the Niners, at Browns, at Jets. I mean, it's like it's like the NFL planned it to go this way, like with that schedule. Oh yeah. Where like Dolphins start hot and then they, they can fall. And again, that's a brutal schedule. Like getting through that three and three would probably be a success as long yeah. as if the Jets aren't, you know, jetting at that point. Um, so like that's that's brutal regardless of what team you are. Um, so but I, I go through the schedule and I put them at like 10 9 wins. Okay. Speaking of the Jets, let's get to them. Mm-hmm. Solid offseason. Uh allegedly Aaron Rodgers is returning. I keep hearing. <laughs> So the <laughs> NFL loaded up on the Jets' single window games, seven of them in their first 11 contests. Is New York must-see TV or streaming or however you watch the NFL these days, or will it be an eyesore the first two and a half months of the season, Mr. Skinner? So I know Justin wants to go off, so I won't go too deep. Here's where I I do have some confidence in the Jets. There are two bad parts of the team last year where quarterback, which was awful, 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 I'll never forget people being like, you guys don't believe in Zach Wilson. Yeah, no shit. Um, very beginning of football today. I felt like I was taking crazy pills. Uh, and then the offensive line. So not only did they improve at those spots, you know, hypothetically with Aaron Rodgers and the offensive line additions, they also improved the depth. Tyrod yes. Taylor as the backup is huge. Olu yep. Fashionu as your backup tackle is huge. Now, if two or three O-linemen get hurt, then you're effed. But we're not living in that world right now. So I think the running game is going to look like Brees Hall is 47th of 48 in rushing success, despite how great, he, like how awesome he is. So the O-line, Rodgers, like that's going to improve kind of everything. And that defense, I expect to sustain success. So I, I, I am in on the Jets and maybe not as much as Justin, but I am in on the Jets. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in, man. And, you know, it's the it's the saying as old as time, they need to stay healthy. And but that's also the Achilles heel of the team is that they did add players that typically do get hurt. Tyron Smith last year, resurgent year, arguably the best left tackle in football. But that's a guy who could very well get hurt from you. Now it's a great thing that you have Olu, but even let, let's let's talk about Olu like he is. I think that's a great first round pick. I think Olu has the potential to develop it to a top tackle in this league. It may not be from day one. So if you do have either Morgan Moses or Tyron Smith go down, goes down and then Olu has to slide into one of those spots, it may not be great from day one. So that is uh, inevitably for this year that is so important for the New York Jets, that may be a downgrade. But if that line, even if four of them, three of them can stay healthy, and I'm talking about Tyron Smith, Morgan Moses, and Elijah Vera Tucker, if those three can stay there year round, then you're talking about, I think, a really solid offensive line and, th and kind of three of the three of the best, a trio that is really good, one of the best in the NFL. Bobby brought up Brees Hall. I am really, really excited for what Brees Hall could do. Mm -hmm. Second year coming off the ACL, um, you know, there's fantasy football data, there's data that shows that you know, if you come off that second year off the ACL, you're not rehabbing this offseason the leg or the knee. You're back to getting better to being a better football player. You're adding strength. You're getting faster. You're getting quicker. Uh, versus last year, it was all about rehab, rehab, rehab. He's about to be 23 under this vastly improved offensive line. There will not be as much pressure on him, hopefully with stacked boxes now that you have better quarterback play. That's the biggest thing with Brees Hall for me is Rodgers being there. One, just checking into the right plays with run stuff and not having teams being like, we don't give a shit about your quarterback. You know, and if there are ways, the I think what Brees Hall showed that he could do last year, he got a shit ton of catches just as like this checkdown guy. But I think it, I think it kind of worked for them. And I am a big fan of 
at times and in spurts, if your run game isn't working and that success rate's down, like he had a, you know, he did have a pretty low success rate last year. I think it was like 39 and a half percent, according to pro football reference, where you typically want your running back in the forties somewhat. I am a big fan of utilizing Brees Hall and your running backs as an extension of the pass game. Let's just get him on a swing pass. If the box is if the box is stacked and it's loaded, we're not paying attention to Brees Hall out there. That's the best way to get a guy in space that can make a guy miss and take it to the house. So, um, you know, underrated. We're always talking about the offensive line. And we're talking about Aaron Rodgers, maybe even talking about the lack of weapons around Garrett Wilson. Brees Hall coming off that second year off the ACL. I am really, really excited about, especially with the improved O-line. So back to the question, which I is never like. I never like answering Chris's question. (laughs) It's okay. Well, if you don't like the questions, believe me, that's my fault. That's on me. That's not on you. If you're not answering, no, no, they're going to be must see TV. I I think that was the whole thing. Yeah, they're they're going 100, percent and they have continuity on their side. Where you know you still have Nathaniel, which believe it or not, I don't know why my brain thought that Nathaniel Hackett was fired. He's still the offense coordinator because he should have been right. (laughs) I, I, I looked it up online and I'm like. Is this like a mistake? Like I had to actually check the full website. Like, oh, he's just still here. So they have the continuity, which sometimes is a lazy talking point for a bad coach. But Aaron Rodgers is the it matters. system. Hackett stinks. Aaron Rodgers is the system, and he knows the system, and he is the system. So it's good for those players on that offense that are, that are going to know the language, that are going to know what you know. They had a whole camp with Rodgers last year, and it's even you know, like Bobby said, it's better for the defense. Where sometimes typically defenses get off to slower starts everybody's on the same page oh yeah and they added Hassan Reddick by the way which I do think is an upgrade to uh Bryce Huff yes so the um th- the answer to the question is absolutely it's must see it, the question wasn't will they be great the question is are they must see yes because this could go one of two ways like you know Rogers has done a lot of I'm gonna call it interesting off-field stuff this year but as much as some of the public or media or whomever will be all over and posting his podcast with tucker carlson i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that nobody in that locker room gives a shit they oh no just no absolutely do not. not care like what everybody's well what do you think that uh his his left guard's gonna think about what it, nobody's going to care so whether you're Pro Rogers or anti Rogers on his stance on the world, just know this: it does not matter inside those walls. It doesn't matter. You might think it matters. It does not matter. Can I tell Where you it, something too? Yes. With that. It used to be like everything Rogers did would get blown out of proportion and talked about. He's successfully gotten to the point where we just don't care anymore. Like you mentioned, it, like whatever, like. I don't even think twice. Like you could say, Rogers said that. I'm like, okay, right next. Like no one, no one talks about it anymore because we've gotten to that point, That's which is a call. win for them. But like you said, those players don't get. Those players look up. I mean, they voted care. him what? Like, you know, like the courage. Or what I can't remember what that award was. Which hey, they they look up to him, and as a football player, they should. Like he's a damn good football player, and he it's knows where to put guys and how guys write plays. Like they stay healthy, they should follow him. But Bobby, this is the word I want to get because I do think it's an interesting talking point. He can get frisky in front of the microphone regarding his teammates. And that's fine when you have won four MVPs in Green Bay and you won a Super Bowl and all that sort of stuff. He is now in the market. He is in the market with the team that has gone the longest without making a playoff appearance in the NFL. So they're going to be all over him if he says one little thing about, I mean, we heard him at the draft. About Joe Douglas. Well, you know, they went with Olu with the first pick, which we all think was great. Probably not the best for Aaron Rodgers as he's looking for another weapon. And he goes, well, that was kind of interesting. But, you know, Joe did what he thought was best for the organization. Now, that was just a little swipe, but it was a swipe nonetheless, based on the scar tissue that he had from all those years where they didn't take a skill guy in the first round in Green Bay. So if things aren't great, at some point, is he going to say something that's going to get totally blown out? And now guys are going, Jesus Christ, can we just clean this shit up for just a little bit? Well, here's the thing is I think it's going to, I think he's already annoyed people in the front office and coaching his staff, but in reality, what those guys are on the same side of like, okay, let's just try and bury this and move it along. The 
the offensive co- players are so young that it's even if he like throw even if he like threw Garrett Wilson under the bus, Rogers would know how to like recover that situation. Like, oh, media spinning this. This is what I was saying, right? Um, you know, the defensive side is where you have some vets where like that shit may not fly. And I don't think Rogers is gonna be saying anything too much like that. Um so, but I think this team's town. I mean, again, we, the defense is the strength of this team. We haven't even talked about them that much. Like, I, I don't even love their draft class either, right? I like Olu. Malachi Corley, man, I, I'm not as high as him on others. Mm, okay. And especially this fit, right? We talk about Rodgers with young receivers. I mean, this guy can't – he's just not a good route runner. He was a screen-only guy. He'll find – they'll find some value in that. But at the end of the day, Rodgers is going to value someone who can run a fucking route in the slot um, there. Like – you know, uh, so I, I didn't love their draft, but I think defensively they've been really damn good with offensive, like awful offense on the other side that makes it so hard to play defense. And yet they've been able to be re- like sustained success. I think the defense will be good. If Rodgers can stay healthy, this should be a team that's making the playoff. And Justin pointed it out last week. Their schedule is easy. It's just oh, on prime oh, time. So easy. Can yeah. I tell you this? Why, why in the world were people who are Jets fans complaining about this? It's the prime right. time element of it. Okay, so you got to start the year in San Francisco. All right, sucks. You get it out of the way. We don't, you know, if we're battling for a playoff spot in December, we don't have to fly across the country then when you're damn tired. Like you get to prepare for five months for this game. Mm-hmm. Next week you're on the road, but you're at Tennessee. Come on, the next game you're home against New England, short week, but who gives a shit? You're going against a team that's either Jacoby Brissett or Drake May. Then the next week, you might be going against Bo Nix. Then it might be J.J. McCarthy or Sam Darnold. Somebody's seeing ghosts in that game. Then finally, you get to stare eye-to-eye with Josh Allen. All right. And then you go to Pittsburgh. Who the hell's going to be quarterback? We don't know. And then it's New England again. I mean, it's just, it's months. And, stop complaining about this stuff, Jets and, fans. And their defense has been good enough to like, I mean, they've won seven games both the last two seasons with Zach Wilson, with with like bottom three offense yep. in the NFL. Their defense the last two years has been third in EPA per play, first in success rate, second in both drop back and rushing success rate. So it's not a one trick pony type of defense, right? They Now they lost Huff and JFM, but like Justin said, they added Reddick, which I think is an improvement overall. When you consider the depth that they have that position, they're run again. I think Rodgers is going to do Rodgers, not even just the offensive line improvements, but Rodgers specifically can do wonders with that run game just by getting them into the right run calls at the right time. Um, the question, the, like you said, but here's the thing you look at our top 20 power rankings, which team could we see just plummeting because of injuries? It the is Jets. the New York Jets, they're all their best players on offense outside of Garrett Wilson have injury issues that yep. that is the worry right and like i said i like tyrod taylor as a backup tyrod taylor with nathaniel hackett as an offensive coordinator may not look like he did with brian dable as his offensive mm-hmm. you know play caller uh last year so you know there's there's quite there's question marks with health around this team but i think even if they can stay halfway healthy if if roger stays healthy or even just plays 13 games this defense is good enough to where they're going to beat like you, you mentioned all those those quarterbacks. This defense is going to have their way with those guys. All right. Uh, let's close it out with the New England Patriots. A little bit of change there in the offseason. Bill Belichick is out. Uh, Mayo and Wolf in as coach and decision maker. What is your level of optimism on New England being able to turn the corner without the Hall of Famer at the helm on the sidelines and as the company architect, Mr. Pennick? It's not high. <laughs> it's not high. They they don't have good process, and and we've and we've really broken that down. You know, it starts with adding good players in the front office. They haven't been able to do that even when Bill was here. And I know Bill was kind of like the pseudo GM, but they didn't they didn't change anything in the front office to make you fully believe that they're dedicated to a new change. So, and I don't even fully like this year's draft class anyway. Outside of Drake May, you know, uh, ba- uh, Bobby Baker, Jay, Javon, Javon Baker. J- thank you, Javon Baker our friend that we talked to at the senior bowl um, crazy dude, wild dude, but he's, he's a good one. Uh, Javon Baker. It could be probably the best pick in that draft outside of uh outside uh-huh. of Drake may hopefully. Uh-huh. Now here's my question. We've talked about the offense. We talk about no weapons. What are they going to do on offense? It may even be better to start Jacoby Brissett just to not have Drake may struggle so much to begin with. I, I thought of their defense without bill Belichick. 
because they've remained a top Thank 10. you. No one's talking about this with their defense just because you're automatic. Like, they're losing the greatest defense of mine in NFL history. And despite Bill's flaws as an offensive coach and off and a GM, these last three years where they've been bad, they've been fourth, third, and eighth in EPA play on defense. Like they have the and that's with guy not a lot of talent and your best talent getting injured, like Judon and, and Christian Gonzalez. Like draw yeah, Gerard Mayo's been there, he's been the defensive coordinator. But being the defensive coordinator under Bill is not the same as being the head coach who's now going to call plays on defense. You're losing the greatest defensive mind in NFL history. Yeah. So my thing is, can they maintain that? Because we we know we know the offense is going to be bad, and inevitably, like we don't have con- I I don't have confidence in the front office and surrounding. Like I think there's going to be some more things that will have that will go wrong for them. But even something just to watch this year is that they have they've had top ten units the last couple of years, even though the offense has been really really bad. And it is tougher to have a good defense when your offense is so bad and constantly just giving the ball back to to the other team, right? Can they maintain that? That's my question. I, Rose, I have I, a question for you. Yes. Yes, please. Go ahead. Do you think that we could see this offense surprise, though? Because they added Drake May, right? A guy that I really like. You get Javon Baker, who another guy I really liked. Jalen Polk, who I'm well, not the I'd biggest like fan of, but he's I, like I think him. he's going to find success, right? Someone compared him to Robert Woods pre-draft, and it just like hmm. it hasn't left my mind. So hmm. he's going to be a, a useful player to me at the minimum, and I love Javon Baker. Is there any way this offense surprises with those three additions on on this team? Okay, so what's your definition of surprise? Like averaging more than 14 points per game like they did like last being year? being ranked 17th or 18th in points per game. I don't see that. I don't think there's any way in the world. God, unless the defense creates a ton of short fields somehow. I just don't see it. I I, I think a successful year for them offensively is to make it so that we aren't going, oh my God, Drake May's the next Zach Wilson. <laughs> like that's, to me, that's success. That means that, well, we feel like we've got the right guy in the building because the, I don't think people understand how much pressure there's going to be on this entire group to get it right quickly, right? I mean, it fell off a cliff once Brady left pretty much. Like they had the one Mac Jones playoff year and then it went, boom, it bottomed out bad so how and like do we really feel like a first-time head coach and a first-time first seat decision maker are going to be the guys that drag them not out of an okay situation but a bottom of the barrel offensive situation no they were winning freaking super bowls with subpar offensive talent they were they just were they yeah never, how many, they were uh, able to to keep that defense good and then obviously have Tom Brady. Here's so but do you, do you I'm I'm looking something up right now cuz I want to compare it. Let's see. I, I do I like have, Jalen uh, Polk by the way. I just want to I, I was going to compare maybe Justin Herbert to the Chargers as like a I don't know but they were ranked 21st the year before they got Herbert so. But, but they also remember, had Rivers, right? That was a, a Yeah, but do you remember when um when Herbert took over Dude, every week he was throwing for 350 yards, and it just, like, football was fun for them. It was awesome to watch. There's no way in the world that the Patriots can come close to that. No. No way. Yeah. If, if they score more than... But what conversations would we had around the Texans last year with Nico Collins and Tank Dell and, you know, as the receivers and, like... can that, like, that comes down to offensive I, play call for me there. Yeah, and again, that's another thing, right? I I don't love Alex Van Pelt. Uh, no. I think he can be an okay – like, well, you know Alex Van Pelt better than us, Rose. Yeah, um, he, but he wasn't the play caller in Cleveland. So, you know, he's he's a much more traditional guy. Like, I could see them grinding it out on the ground. And let's – that's the thing is that I feel like they're going to win games 13-10 to 10 or 17-13 if they win. That's they're what not going to win 27 to – 24 no. yeah so that, that's my but that's my like i would feel a lot better about this team if i just liked the people they had running it but it feels like this is the robert Kraft show where we still elliot wolf still is not the official gm gerard mayo again they they didn't interview other head coaches um i just 
I hope Drake may, if, if we do look at the end of this year and you watch Drake may, whether it's like, Hey, he survived this or two, like, Hey, you got to go look deeper than what it is. Like a Trevor Lawrence rookie year is I hope that they can get some, at least talent around him and, or Polk and Baker get there, uh, you know, like, you know, look like pieces there. So, and, and like Justin said, man, I don't know what to expect out of this defense, right? You get, you get Judon and, and Gonzalez back. You like, um, Kyle Duggar there, Jabril Peppers hopefully won't be had to play the same role he had did last year could play a more confined role. So they have like some good players on defense. Mm-hmm. I think they have one not, of the best secondaries not... in the league. Talk about it. I mean, I think you know, Christian Gonzalez is is a CB one in the NFL. Jonathan Jones is more than fine. Very good. You know, he was an undrafted free agent out of Auburn and they he's just a starting corner in the NFL. Uh Kyle Duggar. You know, Bobby, you know, we talked about a lot about him as a, you know, as like a free agent, as somebody that the Giants, hey, the Giants could go after this guy with Xavier McKinney leaving, so they get to retain him. And then Jabril Peppers is, you know, versatile, you know, kind of like they have him listed as a free safety, but I, I kind of have him as like the strong safety box safety. So um, I don't know much about Marcus Jones, but I think like overall, like that outside cornerback duo with safety duo, it's, I, I'm not going to say it's the best. But again, NFL. Belichick it's be is the good. guy who- Belichick's the guy who figures like those Duggar, Jabril Peppers figures out how to use those guys perfectly. Like you could see Duggar and Peppers being miscast without like again, Bill Belichick is not a, he doesn't have a defensive system. His system is I have these players. This is how I'm going to get the most out of them. That's hard to do. That is hard. again the best defense. You could say Gerard Mayo is a top ten defensive coordinator in the NFL. That's still a huge drop off after losing Bill Belichick. Yeah. All right. So let's finish it up with this. We'll do our predictions for the division. If I say that this is the order, Bills, Jets, Dolphins, Patriots, who is disagreeing with me? Not me. I am. And? Jets, Jets number one. Bills number two, Dolphins three, Patriots four. Are you doing that because you're a Giants fan and you want to wrangle up the Jets personnel? No, no, I really I really don't, man. I, I think that the Jets, it is more likely that this crashes and fails. And I'm not just talking about, oh, nine wins, make the playoffs and maybe lose the first round. I'm talking about this could go possibly go up in flames. Wow. I I I, that's a that's a there's a part of me that thinks it because I I have been believe it or not, I've been anti Rogers as the years has gone on. I hate that he's he's like the LeBron James of the NFL. You know, Chris, exactly what you were saying, like post draft. Second best player in and in, in the game's history. No, but right, but it's a great comparison where he just I think he like destroys like front offices where it's so like you well, gotta stop listening to the friends you have about LeBron. LeBron's a great player. So you can't compare those two. No, but like think about what he does with front office where it's like I'm gonna sign my and guys win a championship and I, everywhere I'm he going, goes. I'm going to in well the, the championship that making he won me, a couple uh, years ago. Championship LeBron that he defense. won a couple years ago was a little floozy anyway. Um but you know, influences front office decisions and shit like that. I don't like that. I let, let the football people make the football decisions. Play, be a good football player. Um, stop trying to you know get get the team to sign your buddies again. Um, so that I think it could go up in flames. But on paper, right now, I I can't convince myself to just be a hater and say that. I don't think that there's any way it goes up in flames unless there's major major injury implications. I think this team's good enough to at least compete for a wild card. And I wouldn't be shocked if they won the division, but I got Buffalo still. I got Buffalo. Easy schedule. I think they could even get a well, no, only one team gets a bye now. Yeah. They're gonna they're they're gonna get one or two home playoff games. That's my prediction. Wow. Okay. That's pretty high. That's pretty high on the that's a that's a one or a two seed guaranteed. One, I'm not going to sit here and say one C, but that schedule is just so, so easy. And I I know it's not, you know, it's not always For good now. analysis. It's not good analysis to always just like analyze schedules, but I do believe in the whole, there are some teams that have harder schedules that have a harder road to get to where they need to get. And there are some teams that, it just line. There are years that line up for them perfectly in the regular season, and the Jets have that opportunity right now. Do you guys have any worry that Rodgers just won't be the Rodgers that we all know? Because obviously, that last year in Green Bay. He was still good, but it wasn't the right. first two years and then coming off the Achilles. Do we have any worry about that? No, because the 
it was so bad the last few years at quarterback there. That no, but I'm saying like for them to be that team, you need Rodgers to be the Rodgers we know. Well, to, to, like to win 13 team. games, yes, but to win 10 or 11, no. No, I agree with you there. But I'm talking about like a team that, again, on paper could be a contender. You need Rodgers to be that uh, version of self. So I, I think that'll be interesting to see. Like, what does it like? At some point, these guys do age out, and it's coming off of an injury. Yeah. Well, I think it'll be a fun division. There's a lot of questions in this one. You know, I think the top three teams are fascinating, and keep me posted on how the Patriots do this year. So I don't know. How much I'm watching. watching the Patriots a lot this year. Are you really? Yeah, I want to see Drake May. Okay. If Brissett starts, I won't be. No disrespect to Brissett, but I like Jacoby Brissett too. Me too. I'm just not going to watch the Patriots if he starts. I wish he had actually landed somewhere where. I wish he had landed in like Minnesota. We said that for like 20 different quarterbacks this offseason. <laughs> lucky, lucky JJ McCarthy. All right. We are back at it again at the end of the week. We will have more offseason football analysis because that's kind of what we do. The show is called Football Today. For producer Mikey and Bobby and Justin, I am Chris. We will see you later this week on Football Today.